Chapter Three, Part Two of the Shadow Line: A Confession by Joseph Conrad. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Expatriate in Bangor, Maine. Chapter Three, Part Two. Look here, Mister Burns. I began very firmly. You may as well understand that I did not run after this command. It was pushed in my way. I've accepted it. I am here to take the ship home first of all. And you may be sure that I shall see to it that every one of you on board here does his duty to that end. This is all I have to say for the present. He was on his feet by this time, but instead of taking his dismissal, he remained with trembling, indignant lips and looking at me hard, as though really after this there was nothing for me to do in common decency but to vanish from his outraged sight. Like all very simple emotional states, this was moving. I felt sorry for him, almost sympathetic, till, seeing that I did not vanish, he spoke in a tone of forced restraint. If I hadn't a wife and a child at home, you may be sure, sir, I would have asked you to let me go the very minute you came on board. I answered him with a matter of course calmness, as though some remote third person were in question. And I, Mr. Burns, would not have let you go. You have signed the ship's articles as chief officer. Until they are terminated at the final port of discharge, I shall expect you to attend to your duty and give me the benefit of your experience to the best of your ability. Stony incredulity lingered in his eyes, but it broke down before my friendly attitude. With a slight upward toss of his arms, I got to know that gesture well afterwards, he bolted out of the cabin. We might have saved ourselves that little passage of harmless sparring. Before many days had elapsed, it was Mr. Burns who was pleading with me anxiously not to leave him behind, while I could only return him but doubtful answers. The whole thing took on a somewhat tragic complexion. And this horrible problem was only an extraneous episode, a mere complication in the general problem of how to get that ship which was mine with her appurtenances and her men with her body and her spirit now slumbering in that pestilential river, how to get her out to sea. Mr. Burns, while still acting captain, had hastened to sign a charter party, which in an ideal world without guile would have been an excellent document. Directly I ran my eye over it, I foresaw trouble ahead, unless the people of the other part were quite exceptionally fair-minded and open to argument. Mr. Burns, to whom I imparted my fears, chose to take great umbrage at them. He looked at me with that usual incredulous stare and said bitterly, I suppose, sir, you want to make out I've acted like a fool? I told him, with my systematic kindliness, which always seemed to augment his surprise, that I did not want to make out anything. I would leave that to the future. And sure enough, the future brought in a lot of trouble. There were days when I used to remember Captain Giles with nothing short of abhorrence. His confounded acuteness had let me in for this job, while his prophecy that I would have my hands full coming true made it appear as if done on purpose to play an evil joke on my young innocence. Yes, I had my hands full of complications, which were most valuable as experience. People have a great opinion of the advantages of experience, but in that connection experience means always something disagreeable as opposed to the charm and innocence of illusions. I must say I was losing mine rapidly, but on these instructive complications I must not enlarge more than to say that they could all be resumed in the one word, delay. A mankind which has invented the proverb, time is money, will understand my vexation. The word delay entered the secret chamber of my brain, resounded there like a tolling bell which maddens the ear, affected all my senses, took on a black colouring, a bitter taste, a deadly meaning. I am really sorry to see you worried like this. Indeed, I am. It was the only human speech I used to hear at that time, and it came from a doctor, appropriately enough. A doctor is humane by definition, but that man was so in reality. His speech was not professional. I was not ill. But other people were, and that was the reason of his visiting the ship. He was the doctor of our legation, and, of course, of the consulate, too. He looked after the ship's health, which generally was poor, and trembling, as it were, on the verge of a break-up. Yes, the men ailed, and thus time was not only money, but life as well. 
I had never seen such a steady ship's company. As the doctor remarked to me, you seem to have a most respectable lot of seamen. Not only were they consistently sober, but they did not even want to go ashore. Care was taken to expose them as little as possible to the sun. They were employed on light work under the awnings, and the humane doctor commended me. Your arrangements appear to me to be very judicious, my dear captain. It is difficult to express how much that pronouncement comforted me. The doctor's round, full face, framed in a light-colored whisker, was the perfection of a dignified amenity. He was the only human being in the world who seemed to take the slightest interest in me. He would generally sit in the cabin for half an hour or so at every visit. I said to him one day, I suppose the only thing now is to take care of them as you are doing till I can get the ship to sea. He inclined his head, shutting his eyes under the large spectacles, and murmured, The sea, undoubtedly. The first member of the crew fairly knocked over was the steward, the first man to whom I had spoken on board. He was taken ashore with choleraic symptoms and died there at the end of a week. Then, while I was still under the startling impression of this first home thrust of the climate, Mr. Burns gave up and went to bed in a raging fever without saying a word to anybody. I believe he had partly fretted himself into that illness. The climate did the rest, with the swiftness of an invisible monster ambushed in the air, in the water, in the mud of the river bank. Mr. Burns was a predestined victim. I discovered him lying on his back, glaring sullenly and radiating heat on one like a small furnace. He would hardly answer my questions and only grumbled, couldn't a man take an afternoon off duty with a bad headache for once? That evening, as I sat in the saloon after dinner, I could hear him muttering continuously in his room. Ransom, who was clearing the table, said to me, I am afraid, sir, I won't be able to give the mate all the attention he's likely to need. I will have to be forward in the galley a great part of my time. Ransom was the cook. The mate had pointed him out to me the first day, standing on the deck, his arms crossed on his broad chest, gazing on the river. Even at a distance, his well-proportioned figure, something thoroughly sailor-like in his poise, made him noticeable. On nearer view, the intelligent, quiet eyes, a well-bred face, the disciplined independence of his manner, made up an attractive personality. When, in addition, Mr. Burns told me that he was the best seaman on the ship, I expressed my surprise that in his earliest prime, and of such appearance, he should sign on as cook on board a ship. It's his heart, Mr. Burns had said. There's something wrong with it. He mustn't exert himself too much, or he may drop dead suddenly. And he was the only one the climate had not touched, perhaps because, carrying a deadly enemy in his breast, he had schooled himself into a systematic control of feelings and movements. When one was in the secret, this was apparent in his manner. After the poor steward died, and as he could not be replaced by a white man in this oriental port, Ransom had volunteered to do the double work. I can do it all right, sir, as long as I go about it quietly, he had assured me. But obviously he couldn't be expected to take up sick nursing in addition. Moreover, the doctor peremptorily ordered Mr. Burns ashore. With a seaman on each side, holding him up under the arms, the mate went over the gangway more sullen than ever. We built him up with pillows in the gary, and he made an effort to say brokenly, Now you've got what you wanted. Got me out of the ship. You were never more mistaken in your life, Mr. Burns, I said quietly, duly smiling at him, and the trap drove off to a sort of sanatorium, a pavilion of bricks which the doctor had in the grounds of his residence. I visited Mr. Burns regularly, after the first few days when he didn't know anybody, he received me as if I had come either to gloat over a crushed enemy or else to curry favor with a deeply wronged person. It was either one or the other, just as it happened according to his fantastic sick-room moods. Whichever it was, he managed to convey it to me even during the period when he appeared almost too weak to talk. I treated him to my invariable kindliness." Then one day, suddenly, a surge of downright panic burst through all this craziness. If I left him behind in this deadly place, he would die. He felt it. He was certain of it. But I wouldn't have the heart to leave him ashore. He had a wife and child in Sydney. He produced his wasted forearms from under the sheet which covered him and clasped his fleshless claws. He would die. 
He would die here. He absolutely managed to sit up, but only for a moment, and when he fell back I really thought that he would die there and then. I called to the Bengali dispenser and hastened away from the room. Next day he upset me thoroughly by renewing his entreaties. I returned an evasive answer and left him the picture of ghastly despair. The day after I went in with reluctance and he attacked me at once in a much stronger voice and with an abundance of argument which was quite startling. He presented his case with a sort of crazy vigor and asked me finally how I would like to have a man's death on my conscience. He wanted me to promise that I would not sail without him. I said that I really must consult the doctor first. He cried out at that. The doctor? Never. That would be a death sentence. The effort had exhausted him. He closed his eyes but went on rambling in a low voice. I had hated him from the start. The late captain had hated him too, had wished him dead, had wished all hands dead. What do you want to stand in with that wicked corpse for, sir? He'll have you too, he ended, blinking his glazed eyes vacantly. Mr. Burns, I cried, very much discomposed. What on earth are you talking about? He seemed to come to himself, though he was too weak to start. I don't know, he said languidly, but don't ask that doctor, sir. You and I are sailors. Don't ask him, sir. Some day, perhaps, you will have a wife and child yourself. And again he pleaded for the promise that I would not leave him behind. I had the firmness of mind not to give it to him. Afterwards, this sternness seemed criminal, for my mind was made up. That prostrated man, with hardly strength enough to breathe, and ravaged by a passion of fear, was irresistible. And besides, he had happened to hit on the right words. He and I were sailors. That was a claim, for I had no other family. As to the wife and child, some day, argument, it had no force. It sounded merely bizarre. I could imagine no claim that would be stronger and more absorbing than the claim of that ship if these men snared in the river by silly commercial complications as if in some poisonous trap however i had nearly fought my way out out to sea the sea which was pure safe and friendly three days more that thought sustained and carried me on my way back to the ship in the saloon the doctor's voice greeted me and his large form followed his voice issuing out of the starboard spare cabin where the ship's medicine chest was kept securely lashed in the bed place. Finding that I was not on board, he had gone in there, he said, to inspect the supply of drugs, bandages, and so on. Everything was completed and in order. I thanked him. I had just been thinking of asking him to do that very thing, as in a couple of days, as he knew we were going to sea, where all our troubles of every sort would be over at last. He listened gravely and made no answer. But when I opened to him my mind as to Mr. Burns, he sat down by my side and, laying his hand on my knee amicably, begged me to think what it was I was exposing myself to. The man was just strong enough to bear being moved and no more, but he couldn't stand a return of the fever. I had before me a passage of sixty days, perhaps, beginning with intricate navigation and ending probably with a lot of bad weather. Could I run the risk of having to go through it single-handed, with no chief officer and with a second quite a youth? He might have added that it was my first command, too. He did probably think of that fact, for he checked himself. It was very present to my mind. He advised me earnestly to cable to Singapore for a chief officer, even if I had to delay my sailing for a week. Not a day, I said. The very thought gave me the shivers. The hands seemed fairly fit, all of them, and this was the time to get them away. Once at sea, I was not afraid of facing anything. The sea was now the only remedy for all my troubles. The doctor's glasses were directed at me like two lamps, searching the genuineness of my resolution. He opened his lips as if to argue further, but shut them again without saying anything. I had a vision of poor Burns so vivid in his exhaustion, helplessness, and anguish that it moved me more than the reality I had come away from only an hour before. It was purged from the drawbacks of his personality, and I could not resist it. Look here, I said. Unless you tell me officially that the man must not be moved, I'll make arrangements to have him brought on board tomorrow, and shall take the ship out of the river next morning, even if I have to anchor outside the bar for a couple of days to get her ready for sea. 
Oh, I'll make all the arrangements myself, said the doctor at once. I spoke as I did only as a friend, as a well-wisher and that sort of thing. He rose in his dignified simplicity and gave me a warm handshake, rather solemnly, I thought. But he was as good as his word. When Mr. Burns appeared at the gangway, carried on a stretcher, the doctor himself walked by its side. The program had been altered in so far that this transportation had been left to the last moment on the very morning of our departure. It was barely an hour after sunrise. The doctor waved his big arm to me from the shore and walked back at once to his trap, which had followed him empty to the riverside. Mr. Burns, carried across the quarter-deck, had the appearance of being absolutely lifeless. Ransom went down to settle him in his cabin. I had to remain on deck to look after the ship, for the tug had got hold of our tow-rope already. The splash of our shore-fasts falling in the water produced a complete change of feeling in me. It was like the imperfect relief of awakening from a nightmare. But when the ship's head swung down the river away from that town, oriental and squalid, I missed the expected elation of that striven-for moment. What there was, undoubtedly, was a relaxation of tension, which translated itself into a sense of weariness after an inglorious fight. About midday we anchored a mile outside the harbour. The afternoon was busy for all hands. Watching the work from the poop, where I remained all the time, I detected in it some of the languor of the six weeks spent in the steaming heat of the river. The first breeze would blow that away. Now the calm was complete. I judged that the second officer, a callow youth with an unpromising face, was not, to put it mildly, of that invaluable stuff from which a commander's right hand is made. But I was glad to catch along the main deck a few smiles on those seamen's faces, at which I had hardly had time to have a good look as yet. Having thrown off the mortal coil of shore affairs, I felt myself familiar with them, and yet a little strange, like a long-lost wanderer among his kin. Ransom flitted continually to and fro between the galley and the cabin. It was a pleasure to look at him. The man positively had grace. He alone of all the crew had not had a day's illness in port. But with the knowledge of that uneasy heart within his breast, I could detect the restraint he put on the natural sailor-like agility of his movements. It was as though he had something very fragile or very explosive to carry about his person, and was all the time aware of it. I had occasion to address him once or twice. He answered me in his pleasant, quiet voice, and with a faint, slightly wistful smile. Mr. Burns appeared to be resting. He seemed fairly comfortable. After sunset I came out on deck again to meet only a still void. The thin, featureless crust of the coast could not be distinguished. The darkness had risen around the ship like a mysterious emanation from the dumb and lonely waters. I leaned on the rail and turned my ear to the shadows of the night. Not a sound. My command might have been a planet flying vertiginously on its appointed path in a space of infinite silence. I clung to the rail as if my sense of balance were leaving me for good. How absurd! I hailed nervously. On deck there! The immediate answer, yes, sir, broke the spell. The anchor watch man ran up the poop ladder smartly. I told him to report at once the slightest sign of a breeze coming. Going below, I looked in on Mr. Burns. In fact, I could not avoid seeing him, for his door stood open. The man was so wasted that in that white cabin under a white sheet and with his diminished head sunk in the white pillow, his red moustaches captured one's eyes exclusively, like something artificial. A pair of moustaches from a shop exhibited there in the harsh light of the bulkhead lamp without a shade. While I stared with a sort of wonder, he asserted himself by opening his eyes and even moving them in my direction. A minute stir. Dead calm, Mr. Burns, I said resignedly. In an unexpectedly distinct voice, Mr. Burns began a rambling speech. Its tone was very strange, not as if affected by his illness, but as if of a different nature. It sounded unearthly. As to the matter, I seemed to make out that it was the fault of the old man, the late captain, ambushed down there under the sea with some evil intention. It was a weird story. I listened to the end, then stepping into the cabin I laid my hand on the mate's forehead. It was cool. He was light-headed only from extreme weakness. 
suddenly he seemed to become aware of me and in his own voice of course very feeble he asked regretfully is there no chance at all to get under way sir what's the good of letting go our hold of the ground only to drift mr burns i answered he sighed and i left him to his immobility his hold on life was as slender as his hold on sanity i was oppressed by my lonely responsibilities i went into my cabin to seek relief in a few hours sleep but almost before i closed my eyes the man on deck came down reporting a light breeze enough to get under way with he said and it was no more than just enough i ordered the windlass manned the sails loosed and the topsails set but by the time i had cast the ship i could hardly feel any breath of wind nevertheless i trimmed the yards and put everything on her i was not going to give up the attempt End of chapter 3 Recording by Expatriate in Bangor, Maine